everybody. Uh, hello, friends. Welcome. I am Julie Huffman, the genealogy librarian at Los Angeles Public Library, and welcome to Genealogy Garage. Uh, genealogy Garage is our monthly genealogy program that usually takes place on the third Saturday of every month. And if you want to hear about what's happening each month, just send me an email right here, and I'll put you on my mailing list. I just send them out once a month, so don't worry, I won't hassle you. It'll just tell you what's coming up next. So Genealogy Raj is co-sponsored by the Southern California Genealogical Society that just wrapped up their wonderful Jamboree, annual Jamboree conference. And we're also co-sponsored by the Genealogical Society of Hispanic America, Southern California. Today's presentation will show you some usual and unusual ways to try to uncover former slave ancestors. And along those lines, happy Juneteenth, our newest federal holiday just approved by Congress. And so today, I figured it would be a perfect time to talk about this tricky, sometimes frustrating, always satisfying area of ancestral research. This presentation is being recorded, so you will be able to watch it later. So don't worry if I'm talking too fast and don't worry about taking too many notes. There's also a link in the description copy on Facebook and YouTube to a handout that you can click on and download. And it has a lot of the links that I'll be talking about today. If you have trouble downloading the handout, just email me and I'll email you with the handout. This presentation lasts one hour, and then we'll take questions. So just ask the questions you think of in the chat box, and we'll get to them at the end. Okay, so let's get started. There are probably a few reasons why you're sitting in on this presentation today. There's the intellectual reason, because it's a puzzle and a mystery to figure out where you come from. You're probably curious just who were your people and what was their life experience. I also believe there's a spiritual component to this pursuit. Finding your ancestor's name when so many of the official records refuse to name slaves gives honor to that person. And one day you may even be able to claim government reparations on behalf of the forced servitude of your ancestor. But believe me, you're going to have to prove to the authorities that you really did descend from a slave. And that some of the tips that I talk about today will help you maybe do just that. Finally, as Ziggy Marley sang, if you don't know your past, you don't know your future. So step one, find your family back to 1870. And why I say 1870 is that in that year was conducted the first federal census that named and located all Americans, black, white, men, women, children, immigrants, everyone who was here in America in 1870 would be named in the 1870 census. Before 1870, the U.S. Census did not contain the names of slaves. And because they were not named, this is the primary reason slave research can be so challenging. But in theory, you should be able to find your ancestors in the 1870 census, whether they'd always been free or had just been freed five years earlier. And to do this, you follow the same steps everyone who had ancestors in America in 1870 would follow. You start with the people you know who were here in the 1940 census. Find them in that 1940 census and move slowly back in time every 10 years until you hit the 1870 census. 1940 is the census you start with because it is the most recent census we can access due to privacy laws. And here's some exciting news. Next April, the 1950 census will be made available for all of us to take a look at. Once you get back to the 1870 census, you're going to see much information that might be helpful when you go to look for your ancestor in 1860. So in the 1870 census, 
you'll really want to pay attention to all the people who were in the household with your ancestor, the ages, places of birth, and the people who lived around them. So as an example on how you can do all of this, we're going to look at my partner's grandmother, Joyce. Here is a snapshot of the 1940 census in which I found Joyce. She's living here in the house headed by her mother, Anna Mae Patterson, or Mae as she's called in this census, and her two sisters, Billy and Dorothy. And this is where it pays off to ask your living relatives questions about their lives. I found this census very easily because Joyce herself told me where she was living in 1940, and she told me the names of her mother and sisters. The next step is to find Joyce in the census that took place before 1940. Working backwards, this is the 1930 census. And here I find Joyce A. You'll see the handwriting is a little shaky, so sometimes you really have to decipher it. Here Joyce is a baby in 1930 because she was born in 1929. But we see her this time in the household of her grandmother, Lucy Matthews, who shows up on the earlier page than this shows, and again with her mother, May, and this time May's sister, Icy Harris. The 1930 census, like many of the other later censuses, labels how everyone in the household relates to the head of the household, which is how I found out Lucy Matthews, not shown here, was the mother of May and Icy and the grandmother of Joyce. Now, because Joyce was born in 1929, she should not show up in the next census we're going to try to find, the 1920 census. So instead, I have to look for Joyce's mother, May. And here is May in the household of her mother, Lucy, and Lucy's husband, James Harris. Again, the relationships to the head of the household are spelled out in this census, so it helps to confirm how people are related to each other and that I'm on the right track. Anna Mae was born in 1908, so she should show up in the next census we're going to find, the 1910 census. And sure enough, here she is in the household, headed by her mother, Lucy Matthews. You'll see she's going by Annie M in this census rather than May. And this is a good example of how you have to really be flexible when you're searching for your ancestors by name. Nicknames, middle names, initials, will sometimes be the way your ancestor is represented in them. So you have to be open-minded when you're searching using their names. This census also names some new people to us. May's siblings, Edward, Solomon, I see again, spelled differently, and Hausper. This gives us more clues to Joyce's family. And two surnames are mentioned here, Matthews and Patterson. So that will also add to Joyce's story. In the next census, 1900, May should not yet be born, so we will now turn to looking for her mother, Lucy Matthews. And here she is in 1900, heading a household that includes her son, Thomas. And on the next page, not pictured here, I found son Edward and daughter Isalee, or Icy, as we've seen. And identifying Icy in the household from census to census gives us evidence that, again, we are on the right trail. Now, ideally, we want to go back to the census before 1900, but the 1890 census no longer exists. Well, parts of it do exist, fragments here and there, but the majority of it burned in a fire. It's one of the great tragedies in genealogy, but we try to work around it. So because of this, I want to go back to the next census available, the 1880 census. And Lucy, as we've seen in the censuses we've found, was born, in eight, born about 1870. So we should find her as a 10-year-old in 1880. And here she is, living in the household of her mother, Emmeline Mathis, with siblings John, William, and Emmeline Jr., I checked in with Joyce at this point and asked her if this looked right, and she excitedly, excitedly said yes. She had known her grandmother Lucy very well and had heard the story of Emmeline. And Joyce had heard that Emmeline had been a former slave. So again, family interviews are very important to keep you on the right track. 
You'll also notice here that Emmeline spells her last name Mathis with an I. And Lucy before, in the records we found before, had spelled it Matthews sometimes. So again, here's an example of how you have to be flexible regarding the ways your ancestors spelled their last names. Now Lucy is only 10 here, so she may be a baby in the next census, the 1870 census, or she may be not born yet. So if I don't find her, I'm going to want to look for her mother, Emmeline. And here I found her in 1870 as M. Matthews. Because her sons John and William are here, and their ages agree with how old they were when I found them with her in 1880, I have some extra proof that this indeed is my Emmeline Matthews. So now I've accomplished step one. I've found Joyce's ancestors back to 1870. And this is what you first need to do. Trace your people back until you found them in the 1870 census. Now we want to try them to find them before 1860, and this is where it gets a little tricky. The first thing, though, that we have to do is not to automatically assume the ancestor was a slave. According to a study of the 1860 federal census, and I'm assuming the 1860 slave schedules, which we'll, which we'll talk about in a minute, 10.8% of the African American community in 1860 in America was free. Now this means about one in 10 of all African American people should show up by name in the 1860 census. Remember, slaves were not named in the 1860 census, but all free people were, including free people of black, Indian, and any other heritage. And as an aside, this study indicates 53% of those free black people lived in the South, which I found remarkable because I'd always thought that most free black people had lived in the North. The citation for this statistic is here on the screen, but it's also in your handout. If you find that I was off in my math and that would not be the first time, please let me know. And now a little bit about the federal censuses before the Civil War. The first federal census was in 1790. Until 1850, these censuses were pretty bare bones, just listing the head of the household. But all free heads of household were named, regardless of race. Then, in 1850 and 1860, all free people were named, not just the head. However, slaves were still not named in these regular 10-year federal censuses. Then the Civil War happened and slavery was banished. So by 1870, everyone was named in the census. Some states even conducted their own censuses and Wikipedia has a nice list of those and you'll see the URL in the handout. These censuses are likely to be found digitized at Ancestry.com. Here's an example of an 1860 census. You see Rosa here, and she is a free woman, and we know that because she's listed here by name in the census. And this column here, she's classified by the census taker as M, which stands for mulatto. Here's an example of an older mayor an older, even more bare-bones census. This 1830 census is a really wide sheet of paper, so I've spliced two sections of it together here. It's separated by that big black diagonal line. And here you can see a woman named Sally Daly. And here under the column Free Colored Persons, you'll see a tick mark in this box which shows us she's a free black woman between the ages of 55 to 100. So in 1830, Sally shows up here because she's free and she is the head of her household. This 1810 census is Joan as the head of the My heading columns, which you can't. And the numbers though, to the right of him represent him and his family members, how many 
people of each age group are in the household. On the far right of this sheet, you'll see a column that tells us how many slaves he had. He had 26. So that's the extent that slaves are named in the 1810 census. They're not named, they're just a number. In addition to the regular federal censuses and the state censuses, there were things called slave schedules. And there are only two of them, one for 1850 and one for 1860. You're only going to find the slave owners named in these. And then next to their names, you'll find columns representing the slaves that they had. The slaves will not be named. You'll just see ages, genders, and complexion noticed. Here's an example of an 1860 slave schedule. Someone over here who looks like W. Hambra is the slave owner. And I might go to the 1860 regular census to also see his name handwritten so I can figure out what that name is. But it looks a little like W. Hambra. These are the slaves he has. And they're separated out by age, by gender, and by skin color. I'm never entirely sure who categorizes complexion. Does the person really know this slave is half white, and that's why they've labeled them M for mulatto? Or is he just stating that because the slave has a lighter skin tone? I usually consider skin color comments to be subjective, so I don't pay too much attention to it. But down the road, it could be a clue to your ancestor. So the next step that you now need to do is try to find your person, your ancestor, in the regular 1860 census. But if you can't find that ancestor in the 1860 census, and I couldn't find my Emmeline, then you can probably assume he or she was a slave in 1860. So the next big step at this stage is to try to figure out who your ancestors quote unquote owner was. And why on earth would you want to spend your time researching this person? Well, because the free slave owners will be better documented than your ancestor was. And their records may name names or lead you to, to figure out where your ancestor lived. So you'll want to find these slave owners in the censuses, but you can also look for them in probate records. These are wills, deeds, bills of sale. When the slave owners willed their property to their heirs, this property also included slaves. And to tell an heir which slave specifically was going to go to them, the wills would name these slaves in the documents. Ancestry.com has a great collection of digitized probate records for every state. Not every, probate, not every probate record that was ever made, but it's a good starting point. Plantation records. These are the family papers of plantation owners and can include registers of slaves, diaries, business papers, anything related to the house, family, and farm. If the owner of your ancestor had many slaves and was wealthy, you'll want to see if plantation records exist. Along the same line, personal account books. This might be more of a financial ledger for the happenings on the plantation. For instance, if a doctor had to be called because a slave was sick, it might record how much was paid to that doctor, but also the slave's name. The purchase and sale of slaves might be registered in these. We'll go through how to look for these shortly. Okay, so all this is fine once you know the owner of your ancestor, but how on earth do you figure out who was the owner of your ancestor? This is a big question you've got to answer. And that is where the 1870 census can come in handy. You'll eventually want to examine the 1860 census for the same location you found your ancestor living in 1870. Now, you might think a recently freed slave would want to get out of Dodge the minute freedom was announced. But if you think about it, the person probably couldn't read and write, 
didn't have any money or possessions, didn't have a way to travel somewhere, and had a community of support, meaning other newly freed slaves, living right where they were. So oftentimes former slaves stayed put in the same town they'd been in when they were slaves. Emmeline had been in Bienville Parish, Louisiana in 1870. So I'm gonna to want to take a hard look at the Bienville Parish census for 1860. You'll want to notice the names and birthplaces of people who lived near your ancestor in 1870. Are there other people with the same surname? Do any of the white people in the community have the same last name as your ancestor? Where were they born? Was it the same place as your ancestor? This is especially noteworthy if they were born in a different state than the one they live in in 1870. Who are the big landowners or farmers in the 1870 community? These people may have owned slaves in the 1860 census. The census will show you how much real estate a person owned, so this can inform you as to who are the bigwigs in the community. Look at the people in the house of your ancestor in the 1870 census. Which of them would have been alive in 1860 and how old would they be? Where were they born? What are their genders? This is the information you're gonna to wanna to check against when you look at the slave schedules. Here's an example. Looking at this snapshot of the 1870 census, we see the Metoyer family living in this parish in Louisiana. We also see that the race column cites that they are B for black. So this is a free black family living in this parish in 1870 with the surname Metoyer. Now if we look at the 1860 slave schedule for the same location, we see a slave owner with the same surname as our ancestor, Metoyer. We also see that there are three black male slaves that are ages six, four, and three in the slave schedule. So what we do is we then look back at the 1870 census and we see three black males in this household that are 16, 14, and 12. Since the census is 10 years later than that 1860 slave schedule, it's highly likely that these three boys might be the same ones mentioned only by age and gender, gender in that slave census. Therefore, we are going to want to investigate this woman. So if I look at Emmeline's 1870 census, who in her household is going to be alive in 1860? Well, definitely Emmeline. She's 40 here in 1870, so she should be around 30 in 1860. And possibly her eldest son, Jacob. He's either gonna be a baby or not yet born. Her other two sons, age seven and three, will not show up in the 1860 census. Then we look at who lives around her, and we see Charles Riley and 16-year-old wife, Margaret. He's only 27, so they probably are husband and wife, and they happen to be black, as you can see in the race column. Joyce had told me she thought her grandmother, Lucy, had a sister named Margaret. So possibly this next door neighbor, Margaret, is Emmeline's daughter. Using this as a theory, we also want to keep our eyes peeled for a six-year-old female slave in the household of a 30-year-old female slave, Emmeline, in the 1860 slave census. You'll notice here Emmeline was born in South Carolina. And since the census for this town is only 24 pages long, it wouldn't hurt to go through page by page and notice who else was born in South Carolina. Maybe they all moved here together. We also want to look to see if there are any white people in this census with the same last name as Emmeline, Matthews. Were they born in South Carolina? Both Margaret and Jacob were born in Louisiana. So this means Emmeline was in Louisiana, possibly by 1854 when Margaret was born, and definitely by 1860 when Jacob was born. So it seems that she should have been in Louisiana by the 1860 census. 
I then looked for any white person in this 1870 Bienville Parish census who had a surname similar to Matthew's and who was born in 1842 or earlier because then he or she would have been old enough to show up in a slave census if they owned slaves. In this relatively small census, I found these people, these white people who fit the bill. And this one right here was born in South Carolina, just like Emmeline. So then I went to look for the 1860 census in Bienville. And I found out there are no 1860 censuses for Bienville Parish, Louisiana, because they were lost or destroyed. And this was my reaction. However, that should not hinder me from investigating these white Math Matthews people anyway. Something eye-opening still might come from that. I feel the need to share my failures as well as my successes because searching for slave ancestors is not for wimps. You need to be tenacious and upbeat. And I'm working on it. Now, I've been operating under the assumption that Emmeline's last name came from a previous owner, but that was not always the case, which leads us to the next question. How did your ancestors get their last names? Although I've run into slaves taking on the name of their former master often, Family Search states this happened less than 15% of the time. So what are the other ways a former slave could choose a last name? Well, some slaves were given surnames before they were free to distinguish them from other people on the plantation who had the same first name. Some former slaves gave themselves surnames based on their occupations, like Weaver or Cooper. Some former slaves took on the maiden name of the wife of the plantation owner. Some former slaves took on the surname of an owner they had before their last owner. And then some census takers took it upon themselves to actually assign a last name if they knew the freedmen before they were free. And this is sometimes why you will see, their, see your ancestor's name change from census to census. Because maybe then the freedmen decided they didn't like that name that the census um, person gave them. And taking on a new name back then was a lot easier than it is now. You just basically started calling yourself something new and it stuck. Uh, some of the freemen took on the surnames of famous historical fi figures and some simply took the name Friedman or Freeman. And here's a link to a nice blog article that discusses this more in detail. The URL is in the handout. Now, regardless whether your ancestor may or may not have taken the last name of a former slave owner, we have to start somewhere. So looking at our tree in general, we want to notice different ways our ancestors may have spelled their names and notice if it changed at all between censuses and why would that have happened so it's something to analyze we also want to notice the surnames of the people they married even if they don't relate to us by blood because this might lead us to a community of people and we want to look at the mid middle names of their kids did they give one of them a middle name that was their mother's maiden name for instance so one thing I had noticed when I was looking closely at Emmeline's 1870 census was that there was a man with the last name Tobin living on a page over from her. And this rang a bell for me because I remembered that Emmeline's daughter Lucy had married a man with the last name Tobin, Jesse Tobin. Looking closer, I could see this Aaron Tobin had been born in South Carolina the same place Emmeline had been born, and yet here they were now both living in Louisiana. So I decided it might be interesting to see where Jesse Tobin had been living in 1870. I'd found Aaron, I'd found Emmeline in 1870, and now I want to find Jesse because maybe that census will be around in 1860, whereas Aaron's and Emmeline's have been destroyed then I can possibly link them all together. 
Well, here is the 1870 census and with presumably other. In this census, relationships to the head of the household are not spelled out, so you have to do some inferring. So this William is 35. Could he be the son of 60-year-old Aaron Tobin, who's living near Emmeline? To try to prove this, I jumped ahead to 1880 just to see where everybody was living. And here in 1880, 44-year-old Will is living next door to 70-year-old Aaron. So yes, it does seem like they could be related, possibly father and son. Since both were born in South Carolina, and Aaron's grandson, Jesse, fathered a child with Emmeline's daughter, Lucy, could they somehow be related to Emmeline? Or somehow know her, or somehow they grew up together? They might be related somehow. Since I can't check a Bienville census in 1860, for traces of Emmeline, nor for Aaron, maybe I can try the 1860 census for Natchitoches. I believe that's how that's pronounced. <laughs> Please forgive me, Louisianians. Um, since Will and Jesse Tobin were there in 1870. However, that came up empty. It was now time for me to step quietly away from the census before harm was done to anyone. Um, so one of the other record sets I mentioned earlier that can be helpful for identifying one's slave ancestors are probate records. And this is because sometimes slave ancestors are mentioned in slave owner documents. In probate records, this would usually be in a will or an estate inventory. Ancestry.com is a good place to go. You can access it, and by the way, you can access that from home through the end of the year if you have one of our library cards. Ancestry and ProQuest graciously extended the amount of time you can access that from home. Um, normally, you have to be at one of our libraries to get into it. They have a great collection of probate records for every state. So when you search the Ancestry.com catalog, you type in the name of the state you want, plus the word probate, and you'll see what's available. I'll show you this in a minute. FamilySearch.org has them too, only you go about viewing them a little differently. To see what they have for your state, you would, st you would click Search Records, then Browse All Published Collections, then Filter by Location, and then Filter by Probate and Court. Their data sets may not be indexed yet though, so you might have to browse through them like you're flipping through the pages of a book. If a, if a data set is not indexed at FamilySearch, that means you can't just type in the name of your ancestor and the record will pop up. You have to just look at them like they're a book that happens to be online. Finally, you can do, always do it the old fashioned way and go directly to the courthouse in the county you want to research or hire someone on site to do it for you. But by far, the easiest first place to try is Ancestry. So you'll want to search the card catalog using your keywords. To check for Tobin's or Matthew's in South Carolina probate records, now remember I'm looking for white Tobin's or Matthew's most likely, because they're gonna be the ones named who have probate records, slaves would not. So I'm looking for Tobin's or Matthews in South Carolina. So I use the keywords South Carolina probate. This brought up two data sets. Of the two, I started with this one. Once you click on this link and bring up the data set, you're then going to type in the name that you wanna search. So I use Tobin and that brought up 10 people who had Tobin as their last names. I went through all of them. It takes a long time, but you have to do it. I went through all of them. Each name was linked to either an index record or an actual probate record. Finally, when I got to see Tobin and his probate of 1832, I found some things that were very interesting. 
it was a digitized inventory of all the goods owned by the deceased person, a Cornelius Tobin of Barnwell, South Carolina. I then paged through this inventory and found this. A list in his inventory of all the Negroes he owned and how much money each was worth. Looking closely through the names, I found this. A slave named Aaron worth $500. And you'll remember I'm looking for slaves in the Tobin records of South Carolina named Aaron or Emmeline. Will and Jesse would not have been born when this 1832 probate was created. But I really perked up when I saw the name Aaron. Because according to later records on Aaron that we have seen, he would have been about 22 years old in 1832. Going, through, going further through the probate, I found the pages of the actual selling of Cornelius's property and a list of who bought what. And it was here that I saw the name of a man who had bought this slave, Aaron, Nathaniel J. Walker. Now I needed to trace this fellow, Nathaniel J. Walker, forward. The year of the probate was 1832, so I followed Nathaniel through the 1840 census, the 1850 census, and then I found him in the 1860 census. Right here in Wynn, Louisiana. Now this N.J. Walker was born in South Carolina, so that looks promising. And just to make sure this N.J. was Nathaniel J., I looked for and found his marriage record to the, name, to the woman who's listed below him in this document, Indiana. And his name was spelled out there, Nathaniel J. I also found him in the corresponding slave schedule, which we'll see in a moment, and that spells out his name. And his location here, Wynn, Louisiana, is about nine miles from where I found Aaron Tobin in the 1870 census. So I am getting super excited here. Now to double check, I wanted to look at that 1860 slave census for Wynn, Louisiana. And I found Nathaniel listed with his slaves, and he has a 52-year-old um, male slave, and Aaron would have been 50 years old or so. So this fits. So it turns out my Aaron had taken on the name of an earlier owner, possibly his first owner, Cornelius Tobin, and not the final person he was living with before emancipation, Nathaniel Walker. My next steps might be to look at all the ages and genders of the slaves Nathaniel Walker owned and see if any might match up to Emmeline. Also, I should see if there are any probate records related to the Walker family. But you'll, you'll, you'll take note that after 1865, when slavery was abolished, you won't see wills anymore of people bestowing slaves upon descendants. So but I can give it a shot. I can look for some Walker probates. How, and I know I'm barking up a good tree with all these clues. Here, here are some other ideas I could pursue and other ideas you can pursue. Since Cornelius Tobin owned a large plantation and had several slaves, which I noticed by looking at his probate record, he may have left behind some plantation records. Personal account books might include day books, slave records, deeds and indentures, diaries, and letters. Maybe Aaron would somehow be mentioned in these. But finding plantation records can be tricky. You'll have to focus on archives to find these, and many archives are not digitized. This is where you have to really start rolling up your sleeves. One place to try is state archives. So just simply start out by Googling your state name and the words state archives. You're also going to want to try historical societies and academic or university archives doing the same Google searching. 
To give you an idea how unique some of this archival material might be, here's an example of a plantation record that lists slave births and deaths. Imagine if I found something like this in Cornelius Tobin's plantation records and Aaron was listed. It would be absolutely a gold mine. Another way to try and find out what archives are out there in the world is to go to Archive Grid. And this is in your handout. Archive Grid is a website that helps you locate places that may have received or collected special material related to a variety of topics. Material that is usually one of a kind. You're going to start by typing in keywords related to what you're looking for. I could be very specific and type in Cornelius Tobin here, but usually you want to be a little more general. For instance, I typed Barnwell County, South Carolina. You may remember that Barnwell is where Cornelius and Aaron were from, where the probate of Cornelius Tobin was written. This brought up 436 different special collections that somehow have keywords Barnwell County, South Carolina associated with them. And this one, based on its description, looks pretty interesting to me. It's a genealogical collection of South Carolina families who lived in the old Barnwell district, like Cornelius did. Maybe there's something in this set related to him. To find out, I notice which repository has the information, that's University of South Carolina, and if I want to go a step further, I can either contact them, or first I should try checking their finding aid. The finding aid might be a more comprehensive index as to what's inside this collection. For instance, it might name all those South Carolina families contained within the set. So if I see it has Cornelius Tobin, I am going to want to contact University of South Carolina. Another way to locate archives is to search the database WorldCat. Our library provides access to WorldCat from our databases page. Once you click Research or Research and Homework from our homepage at www.lapl.org, you can scroll down to the list of databases. I'm going to click on W here to go to WorldCat. And then you'll find WorldCat. And from home, you can access this with your library card. And once you click that, you're in. And you can again type keywords to find archives related to your subject. So here, I'm going to type Blackville, South Carolina. Blackville was actually the town Cornelius Tobin lived in within Barnwell County. This brings up 144 items, but not all of these are archival material. To ferret out the archives from the books, you're going to click this archival filter here. That would then limit the results of the, to just the archives, so, so it significantly limits the number. There are about 11 here, I believe. And then you can read the descriptions, click on them, and figure out which of them look interesting to you, and then contact the owning agency if you want. Archives in WorldCat have been identified and have been added here by Library of Congress's National Union Catalog of Manuscript Collections since 1986. So from 1986 to today, you can check WorldCat for the Library of Congress's archival hold, um, listings. Before that, though, you have to turn to these hard-to-find print volumes, which happily our Art, Music, and Recreation Department has beginning in 1959. So you would go to Art, Music, and Recreation. You would look for the index to this NUCMUC collection. That's the, uh, that's the acronym, NUCMUC for National Union Catalog of Manuscript Collections. And it will tell you the details, kind of a short synopsis of the archival collection. It'll, it'll, it'll tell, the index will tell you which volume to go to to find that abstract. You won't find the actual archival material at our library. This is just a pointer that tells you where to go. Another resource to try 
that's in, that looked really interesting to me, and I haven't yet been able to peruse it, is the, um, I learned it from the Family Search Research Wiki. And by the way, this is a dynamite website to go to whenever you run across a genealogical subject that you have no idea about. So I went there and I searched for plantation records, and it it talked about this film of Southern records, Bellum revolution through the Civil War. That and this is accessible at some libraries, but it's also accessible online via FamilySearch.org. But you have to be at a family history library to view it, and there's a nice big one. In the west in west la so if you go there you can view it you can actually view this microfilm set that's been digitized there now on the family search website they have um, sort of a, a better description of the material you'll find on each microfilm roll it's in pdf form and you can click this from home and when you do that, it's going to describe what you would find on that microfilm reel. So it'll look something like this. It'll have a cover page. It'll have a table of contents for what's on the microfilm. And then a very detailed description of what the contents contain. So before you go all the way over to the West Side Family History Library, you can look at these PDFs to see which roll of film you're going to want to click on while you're there to look through. Now, if you prefer to look at an index for this microfilm set in book form, in our genealogy department at LAPL, we do have a book that has the um, index for this set. However, the simplest way to find archives initially is just to Google it. And I found a couple great, great places to, for me to check for my Tobin research. This bottom one, I found out that the name of the plantation of Cornelius Tobin was called Fairmont. So I did a search for that, and I actually found a website devoted to that plantation. And also, I found a link to a Blackville Area Historical Society, which I am definitely going to want to contact. They might have some secret collection there related to Cornelius Tobin that's going to blow the lid off of this. So I definitely want to contact them. I also found through searching, just using Google, this South Carolina Department of Archives and History. I definitely want to spend some time going through this website and seeing what sorts of things that they have and see if anything might possibly relate to Cornelius. The Library of Congress has a website that points out, points out state digital resources. It leads you to state-specific resources that focus on, cult, on the culture and history of the state. So in this South Carolina-specific group, I might find something that will better inform me about what life was like for Aaron. Between 1850 and 1880, the government published mortality schedules in cooperation with its regular decennial censuses. Mortality schedules listed people in America who had died between June 1st through May 31st, the year prior to the census. And what's neat about them is they give a lot of information about the person who died, sometimes more than you will find in the regular census. And they named slaves. Here's an example of an 1860 Louisiana mortality schedule. We see Millie here. She's a, a 100, she, when she passed away, she was 100 years old. She's categorized as black. And then you'll see this column, free or slave, and an S is written in her box, meaning she was a slave. If you're, so this is an example of an official federal record that actually named a slave before the end of the Civil War, before slavery was abolished. If your ancestor actually died during the year of a census, you may be able to find them in a mortality schedule. Another resource is slave ship manifests. In America, international slavery, as in getting slaves from Africa, was actually outlawed as of 1808. It still secretly happened, but it was officially outlawed in 1808. However, 
domestic transport of slaves via, sh via ship was still allowed. So, for instance, maybe Emmeline and Aaron were transfor transported from a port off of South Carolina to a port off of New Orleans when they moved to Louisiana. Manifests of the people on these boats were kept, so that's definitely worth a look. Ancestry has a good collection of these. Here's an example of what one looks like. This is a manifest of a ship traveling from Charleston to New Orleans in 1851. It names the slaves, you can see them on the left, and it also names the slave owner on the right. Another record set to keep your eyes open for are manumission and emancipation records. These are records documenting the freeing of a slave. Again, you can find a collection of these at Ancestry.com. Here's an example. This is a woman, Lucinda Martin, who was freed due to the Washington, D.C. Emancipation Act of 1862. So you find some nice information about her there. Another place to try looking is for slave bills of sale. They are another research to definitely pursue, but they're hard to find. They're often only in archives or private collections, and sometimes they're not indexed by name, so it could take a while to find your person. You want to do the same techniques to find slave bills of sale, the same way you would look in trying to track down archives. Here's an example of what one of them looks like. Church records are another thing to seek out. However, again, they're hard to find, and they're hard to find here in America because we have so many denominations and some private religious institutions, but they might be the next best, best thing, the next big thing for genealogy research if we can somehow get a consortium or put them together in an easily accessible way. But now, you can find some trans transcriptions of records that individuals have done out there. Um, and just Google to see if there's anything floating around. There are also bigger sites devoted to specific churches' records. But you really have to dig around for them. They could still be located at the church, if the church is still up and running. Or they may have been deposited in a nearby repository or archive. Or they may have been damaged or destroyed in a natural disaster. You have to dig around. Using Google, I found Umbra Search, which is a search tool that looks for digitized African American archives. And then in Umbra Search, I searched for my people in, to in uh, South Carolina, and I ran across this. A church used by black citizens in Blackville, South Carolina the town Aaron lived in. Could he have gone to this church? And if so, where are its records? That is something I'm definitely going to want to pursue. How exciting. Yes, weirdly, some slave owners were able to buy slavery insurance, and because of it, we have documents left behind that can help us identify our ancestors. So if a slave were injured or killed, the slave owner would receive financial compensation. That's why they would buy slavery insurance. Here's the kicker. Most of these insurance companies that sold this insurance were located in the North. So even though the North had abolished slavery, Northern companies were still making money off of it. In 2002, California made insurance companies report the individual policies that they had made years and years ago before the Civil War. And because of that, the public learned about the specifics of these individual policies, including the names of slaves that had been insured and the names of the slave owners doing the insuring. In the grand scheme of things, it's not that many slaves who were insured but it's worth a try. 
you want to go to this online index and it's in the handout and search for your person. I usually search by slave owner because they have a last name which will help better, better identify if they're, if they're related to our people. If you are lucky and a record of an insured slave comes up who looks to be your ancestor, then you can find a copy of the actual policy in Los Angeles Public Library's Social Sciences Department. The government made these insurance agencies send copies of the documents to many repositories for access, and we are one of the repositories they sent them to. So you'd go to the reference desk in Social Sciences and ask about this. Here's an example of one. This is an insurance company based out of New York who insured a slave named Warwick who lived in Kentucky and was owned by John Jones. We also see a little lower on the document, Warwick was to work on a steamboat named Diana. A lot of information on this one sheet of paper. Another place to look is through fugitive slave ads. They were placed in newspapers in both the North and the South that named and described slaves who had run away from their masters. You can see a list of sites on the left, but you can also just Google your state and runaway slave advertisements. After the Civil War ended, there are some dynamite resources that can help you figure out where your ancestor was before freedom. There were voter registration lists created soon after the end of the war. There was a government assistance program put in place, coordinated by the Freedmen's Bureau. A new bank was created to guide people about saving money. And a program to record slave interviews was initiated by the Federal Writers Project of the Works Progress Administration. Every man qualified to vote was required to register, regardless of race, in 1867. Although some black men were still turned away at the polls, many did get their names into these registers. And the 1867 voter registration lists are nice because they exist in time before the 1870 census, so they provide yet an earlier record of your newly emancipated ancestor. The downside is that the lists don't survive for every state, and most again are in archives. This website, which is in your handout, has a nice list of all of the voter lists that are available. And again, Ancestry.com has a group available to search. But also, you just want to try Googling it first, seeing what comes up. Here's an example. It's a big sheet of paper, so I split it in two. But here is a record for William Bautiste in 1869 in Hill County, Mississippi. He has been in the county for three years, according to the time of residence column. His race is noted as colored in the general remarks section. So this record is very helpful in placing your ancestor at least as of 1866. The Freedmen's Bureau was a department set up by the federal government to help former slaves, help to help former slaves primarily, but also other displaced Southern white refugees and it helped people get, the, get on their feet with their newfound freedom. It was established right at the end of the Civil War, and it was so necessary to help people who really had limited resources due to their enslavement. Former slaves and former masters are often named in these records, and there are many, many different kinds of records. It can be a smidge complicated to negotiate your, ways, your way through them. This the Freedmen's Bureau is a presentation unto itself, and because of that, we will be having experts give that presentation for the October Genealogy Garage. This is one of the most, one of the most valuable sets of records to consult when researching your African American ancestors. And there are some links in the handout you can download, 
but I'm hoping you can join us in October because the two women who are joining us just know everything, absolutely everything about the Freedmen's Bureau. The Freedmen's Bank, which is not related, by the way, to the Freedmen's Bureau, but the notion of having one's own savings account is commonplace for us. But for former slaves, many of whom had never even seen money, it was an alien concept. The Freedmen's Bank was created for recently freed people, and in turn, it created documents that revealed information about them. Here's an example of a Freedmen's Bank passbook. This is the kind of information you can oftentimes find in one of these passbooks. And the one on the left tells us everything here that's in red. So lots of information. I have yet to find one of um, the, the ancestors I'm researching having a bank record, but if they do, you can get loads of information. Another exciting resource to try is the Library of Congress's collection of slave narratives. This collection is worth checking out. Although it's a relatively small percentage of the African American population who were interviewed. But if your ancestor is in here, you're here, you're in for a special experience. You want to go to this website and look at this online index to check for your people. And finally, a component that I consider crucial, the commercial DNA test. By submitting your DNA to one of the big databases, including Ancestry.com, Family Tree DNA, or 23andMe, you might be able to solve some of those connections that the physical documents cannot. You could prove or disprove theories you're working on, or you can connect to other people who are researching the same people you are. In fact, I was able to cross-check some of my findings by seeing if Joyce really did relate genetically to the Tobin family. And she did. Several descendants of Will Tobin showed up as matches to her in her list, confirming again that we're on the right track. Now, if I can just figure out Emmeline and her, Mathis, and her Matthews line, which I'm having a really tough time with, but that's my next step. Are there any questions out there? I should have mentioned too in my, um, I, I don't know why I didn't, there are several African-American related um, genealogy groups out there that you should think about contacting. They're, uh, on the west side here in LA, we have CAGS, California African-American Genealogical Society. Hi CAGS, if you're watching. Um, super friendly, nice people, and they might be able to help you find your people. Well, if you don't have any questions now, which is absolutely fine, I, I hope I didn't overwhelm you. Remember, you can watch this session over again and just send me an email. Just send it right to that email address right on the screen and I can, um, I can, I can respond to you or, or guide you. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining, and I hope to see you next month. In July, the, the California subject specialist, um, Kelly Wallace, and I are going to be talking about California history and, and, and how to find your ancestors who might have been California pioneers. All right, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.